authors that are um, part of Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, a number at OSU, and a number with NOAA. Um, and really with my team, that's kind of the cornerstone of what we do is these big collaborations really drive how our work can uh, go forward and why we can get so much done. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk about is the biology and ecology of the relatively newly described Deacon rockfish. Um, the Deacon was broken off from the blue rockfish, and so I'll kind of talk about that history. And then some of the work we've been doing trying to understand the animal. Um, so when I started putting together this talk, the first thing I thought I would do is go back to David Starr Jordan's description of the blue rockfish in 1881. Um, and so when I was reading this, I was actually really surprised to notice the first sentence. And they start talking about how confused they were with the blue rockfish and how they couldn't identify it from something different. But what they're actually confused with is the black rockfish. They couldn't get the black rockfish and the blue rockfish differentiated. And so it seems that blue rockfish have had this kind of perpetual history for over 100 years of um, not being able to be separated from other species. And if you look up in Alaska, there's the dusky rockfish, which was actually described before the blue rockfish going back in time that's also been struggled. So this kind of species group seems to have some difficulties going forward. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting history that's continuing to persist till today. Um, so in California, blue rockfish were a very important fishery. They still are. Um, in the top left, you can see some charter boats back from the 70s. Um, and these were a cornerstone of the rockfish fishery. Um, they're kind of like our black rockfish in that they're a semi-pelagic fish. Um, so these charter boats can target them pretty easily. The advent of echo sounders really promoted that fishery. Um, and then in the lower right, you can also see they had a pretty extensive commercial fishery going forward as well. Um, Following our rockfish crisis, we started doing stock assessments for this species. And so our first stock assessment for this group was in 2007. We only did an assessment for uh, the California stock. So our x-axis is year. Our y-axis, just think of it as some metric of the population. The higher up it is, the better off we are. The lower down we are, the worse we are. And as long as you're above the red lines, all things are good in the world. Um, as you can see from the 1970s down to the 1980s, we see this dramatic decline in blue rockfish. And we're below that lower red line. So that means there are management implications that kick in because of that. Um, you dig into that text and some of the literature around that time, you start to find some interesting things. Um, so on the left is a master's thesis by Jason Cope, who's now a Northwest Fishery Science Center stock assessor. And in his uh, thesis, he started finding genetic evidence that it looked like blue rockfish was actually two different species. So in the map, you can see that green dashed line right about Cape Mendocino. And what he suggested is, is right around Cape Mendocino, we had a separation of stocks or we had a separation of species. So this is kind of our start to some evidence of there may be two different species going on. And then on the right, if we look at uh, Butler's book that comes out in 2012, they start to recognize the blue sided and the blue blotched rockfish. You know this kind of, oh, maybe they're subspecies and information like that. So we're starting to see this evidence going forward that, oh, maybe we actually have two species. Um, if you remember back to that California stock assessment I showed you, we were below some of those red lines. And like I said, there were management effects if, that would kick in if we get there. In Oregon, if we trust this graph on the left, which many scientists were doing, and we did have a separate species, if we were falling under management restrictions from California and we actually had a different species, that could have some big impacts to us that we probably don't actually need to follow through with. So what happened is, is in 2015, collaborators uh, worked together and they defined the Deacon rockfish. They broke it off from the blue rockfish um, based on morphology and genetics. Um, the name Deacon rockfish comes from the fact that the blue rockfish historically when it was caught in San Francisco was called the priest rockfish. So we have the priest and the deacon. <laughs> So that's where this name comes from. So if we go to a more current genetic map um, that was done in 2017, what we see is on this map is the coastlines down south off of central and southern California, the darker blue. Darker blue represents blue rockfish, and the lighter blue is representing the um, deacon rockfish. And what you can see, it's difficult to see, but you basically can see darker colors on the bottom moving towards lighter colors with the top. Basically, there are more deacons up north, like we know. Um, what's interesting, though, is that most of our knowledge about what was just blue rockfish and is now at this point blue and deacon rockfish comes out of the Monterey area, a little bit out of Bodega Bay, and out of Southern California. And so if we look at these maps and we see where those are, 
we're pretty strongly in blue rockfish territory at that point. So what that means is that our basic biological understanding of Deacon rockfish was practically not there. And so that's what we aimed at is go out and figure out, try and just understand some of that basic biology of Deacons. Um, so we tried to assess age and growth, maturity, basic movement ecology of these fish, and then also look for evidence of stock structure. So on our first study, we looked at um, age and growth, maturity, and stock structure. We used hook and line sampling um, every month, and uh, each month we sampled 50 fish. We used just traditional fishing gear, you know, shrimp flies and other jigs, but we also used uh, herring jigs, which you can see down in the lower bottom. Herring jigs are much smaller hooks, lit more hooks on there, kind of bright tinsely, and we had really good um, ability to catch really small fish down to six, seven, eight centimeters with that. And then actually our largest fish, well over 40 centimeters, were caught on the same gear. So it's a very effective gear for this fish. Um, like I said, we sampled the near shore, so we alternated between Seal Rock to the south and Sluts Reef to the north. And then uh, our offshore site was Stonewall Bank. And so sampled each month, collected 50 fish, and we tried to get a wide uh, range of sizes, so we didn't, the size range we see is not representative of what the distribution is out there super well. It's pretty strong, but we did purposely try and fill out tails in there a little extra so we can look at things. Each fish was measured, weighed, and then photographed at sea. And then uh, for fish underneath 20 centimeters, we took fin clips to preserve for genetics. And then later on, we started taking fin clips of all species for stock structure analyses. Um, the next day in the lab, we extracted otoliths from all of the fish. Um, and then we also extracted ovaries from the female fish and prepared them for histology. We then again weighed each fish and linked it again um, just to have a more precise measurement without a bouncing boat and higher precision link boards. Um, I should mention, if people have questions as we're going, we can ask them as I go. Um, so then after we did that kind of first initial blood and guts portion of the laboratory work, we um, then took the otoliths. They were photographed whole after they were cleaned off. And then they were red using break and burn for the larger individuals. The real small ones were just red um, as a whole section. Um, and then we read the maturity slides following Frey et al. Um, using histology. I am by no means a histologist. So this was people much better at this who helped me out doing this work. Um, and so we'll just talk about general trends in maturity, but if you have questions, we can talk about it later, and I will do my best to uh, make you think I know what I'm talking about. Um, and so here's our analyses. First thing we did is we looked at fish condition, and so we calculated a wet uh, weight residuals fish condition. So we fit a um, linear line to a log transformed weight and length of the fish, and then we extracted those residuals. We then used a three-way ANOVA with area, sex, and maturity period, which I'll describe to you a little bit later, to see how those residuals were changing throughout the season by area and by sex. Um, we then fit uh, von bert lamphy growth models um, to the different areas and sexes to see how age and growth parameters might be differing between those areas, and did a bunch of model selection with that using AAC. We then took those von bert lamphy growth parameters and we took the most recent 2017 stock assessment that was conducted for Deacon Rockfish, kind of took it offline, and we input those parameters to see how using different age and growth parameters actually would affect our current status of where the stock was, what our maximum sustainable yield was, and things like that. Understand how these data actually could be influencing the dynamics. And then from the maturity standpoint, we calculated the age and length at 50% maturity. These are important estimates that go into a stock assessment, just kind of standard things. And then we used a standardized uh, length to fecundity relationship for rockfish to look at how length relationships we see in the offshore and nearshore might be representative of fecundity, just kind of a hand wavy, let's see what would happen type thing. And then in our last portion of this study, we um, use genetics and RADSeq, and if you guys have questions about this, fortunately Kathleen is here. She can ask, answer more questions than I can. And then we also use those pictures of those otoliths that we outlined using a program called Shape R, fit a Fourier transform to that, and using those shapes we could look for evidence of stock structure between the nearshore and offshore. So a whole lot of things out of a lot of dead fish. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to point out to you was some interesting pictures we got. Um, so the top left 
fish that you see is a blue rockfish that is 9 centimeters. This is genetically confirmed. And on the top right is a Deacon rockfish that's 8 centimeters. Uh, these fish were caught on the same day. The index, it says seal 15 and seal 23. They were caught 8 fish apart from each other. I personally cannot tell you which one of those is which unless I had done genetics on them. So what we got comfortable and what we ended up doing was anything under 21 centimeters had to go out for genetic ID. We tested ourselves and we were just incapable of identifying blues versus deacons when they were that small. It was just not doable with fish in hand. What we did find when we started doing this is that we found actually quite a few instances of genetically ambiguity or mixed ancestry is what our geneticists, and this was in collaboration with some folks at UCLA. So they suggested maybe there was some hybridization going on. So maybe the species, although they've separated, they haven't fully separated. Or I don't know, there's some potential ecological implications going on there. So just some interesting kind of anecdotes to start the talk. So here's the fish that we collected. Um, the left column is the length of fish that we collected in centimeters. The right column is the age of the fish in years. The top row is the nearshore fish. The bottom row is the offshore fish. The black bars are the females, and the gray bars are the males. So we'll start on the left and on uh, the top left. So what you see is with those nearshore fish, we have this nice big broad spread. We have a lot of kind of diversity in sizes, all the way up to about 40 centimeters, but all the way down to that small size. And it kind of matches between males and females. If we go down into that offshore component, we see a much more tighter distribution with individuals mostly in that 30 centimeter range. But do look in that bottom left, we are catching eight centimeter fish in the offshore. Um, so there are very small deacons occurring out there. Um, and then if we look at our age distribution, the top right, we see that we have this really shifted and skewed distribution for the nearshore fish of much younger fish. Whereas if we go down to the offshore, we see this older um, average age distribution with this long tail going forward, out. So I'm going to take these and kind of mix them together and show you something different with it. So we have here on the x-axis is length in four centimeter bins. And then our y-axis is proportion of fish that are represented by the color. And I'll explain the color in just a second. The left column is the females, right is the males, top is near shore, and the bottom is offshore. And the color is age. So cooler colors are younger, warmer colors are older. So let's start with that 40 centimeter bin um, in the females. So if you look at the top, that's the farthest bin in the female uh, top box. We see this kind of yellowish color. So if we look at our age blocks, that means they're all in about 15 years old-ish in that, that mid-teens. You go straight down to that same age or length class in the offshore, you see much more warm colors going out to the high 30s, suggesting that for those 40 centimeter fish, the near shore, they're all kind of in those mid-teens, whereas we have a very large distribution of ages in the offshore, all the way from the high 30s down to the low 10s or so. So this isn't really that surprising. That offshore area hasn't experienced a lot of fishing. Um, it's, we were working in what's the uh, yellow eye rockfish closure area, so you would kind of expect that it hasn't been fished that hard, but it's nice to confirm that you do see some evidence of fishing pressure. What's also interesting is going forward, as those areas are starting to open back up, it'll be really interesting to go out there and see if we see that loss of those older structure, or if they remain there, this may mean we have some ontogenetic migration, which is something that people have suggested for this species. So it's something that we'll go back and check in a few years or multiple few years, we'll see, but just kind of an interesting finding that came out of it. And so if I take the average length of the fish from that previous graph and I run it through this equation on the bottom, this is a generalized fecundity relationship for rockfish. And we just fit it with these constants and we take the average length of the offshore and nearshore, calculate percentages, that would suggest that potentially 70% of the 2% of the reproductive output of Deacon rockfish is coming from the offshore as composed to the nearshore. So that would mean that by not fishing out there, if this is true, we have a lot of our reproductive potential is offshore, so it's basically effectively acting like a marine reserve. And if we do open it, we may see some pretty large implications. However, this is average length, so it's not taking into account number of fish, reef structure, a whole bunch of things are rolled into this that we're very knowledgeably uh, ignoring in that uh, calculation. Um, so the next thing we looked at was our age and growth models. So um, this is a plot of AIC values for those best fit models. Um, 
For these models, we forced T0, that theoretical age at length 0, to be 0, and we estimated the maximum fish length, L infinity, and the growth rate, K. Um, I estimated them individually and in combination, um, and I'm just reporting the in combination here because it was the best fit, and if I tried to show it all to you, it gets wildly complex. Um, so, and then our y-axis in this plot is a delta AIC. Value of zero is our best model. That means that's the thing that explains what the fish were doing the best. And as we get smaller and closer to that number, it gets better. If we include no covariates in our model, things look really bad. If we just look at area but ignore sex, it's not nearly as good, but a little bit better. Or it's a little bit better, but um, not nearly as good as the best fit model. If we just look at sex, that really is our best explainer, unless, of course, we put both of them in. So basically it looks like we have a stronger effect of sex than we do of area, but working together is the best thing. And so here are those data. Um, left is the nearshore fish, the right is the offshore fish, um, age on your x-axis, length in millimeters now on your y-axis, and then the blue lines and dots are males, and the red lines and dots are females. So very strong evidence of a sexual dimorphism between with larger females growing faster and smaller males. Um, and then really you see that difference in the nearshore and offshore it appears to be in the females with that kind of higher pull to that line. Um, you know, if you look at the numbers and the data we have here, the females were lacking a lot of those larger individuals in the nearshore and were lacking a lot of the small individuals in the uh, offshore. So I think it's probably mostly an artifact of fitting, but given the data that we have and the 900-ish fish we sampled, this is where we ended up. So, it does suggest that there is some differences between the two areas. So taking that data and running it through the stock assessment, what we did is we just compared these in a relative sense between the original model, which was, uh, and then we took the nearshore data, compared it with the offshore and the combination. And I'm just gonna show you percentages rather than numbers because using this in this kind of offline operating model, it doesn't really make sense to look at the numbers. It didn't, it's more about the influences of those data. So if we look at our top row, we have our initial virgin biomass. That's basically how many fish there were in 1892 in this situation. And then our middle row is our terminal year stock status, basically the last year of that model, how well are we doing? And then the bottom is how many we can take, the maximum sustainable yield. Um, and so if we take those growth parameters from the offshore model, we see about an 8% bump in how big the stock used to be relative to now. So basically those faster growth rates and things suggest that there used to be more fish. However, if we take those growth rates and such, what we see is that we're, we're a little worse off right now than we would have been if we had just used those nearshore data. Not much, 1.7%, probably within errors. And our maximum sustainable yield is even down a little bit further. If we take the two growth areas, or we take the area out and just fit the sex models, and we run the combination, we see slight rises. So basically those larger offshore fish seem to help the stock assessment a lot, or a little bit here and there across the board. These are really minor changes. If we take out that T0 being fixed to zero, these numbers jump astronomically. We end up in the 40s and 50% shifts. Um, so that's really a big driver. Um, however, the lack of the small fish offshore really makes not forcing T0 to zero to make sense. So then let's put this in comparison to some historic data. So the first column, McClure 1982, was a master's or PhD thesis here, I'm forgetting, uh, back in 1980s, um, doing work off of Depot Bay looking at age and growth of a number of nearshore species, one being uh, blue rockfish. The 2014 Schmidt work was conducted off of Monterey. Um, this was before they were divided, but she reported for blue blotched and blue sided individually. So she knew enough to keep them separated, so we're able to use her data. Um, the HANA is my predecessor. This was done in uh, concert with the species description. However, these are just nearshore fish. We have nothing for the offshore. And the next three columns are our data from here in those three different combinations of area. The top row is that L infinity again, that maximum growth rate. The middle is the growth rate. And then the bottom is the T0. And in this one, I show the values if we actually let them freely estimate for us. And so if we look at just the top row, we see is that our study in uh, Bob Hannes, we don't see a big difference in what our L infinity was, pretty similar numbers. However, we're a fair four centimeters bigger than California. I don't know if I'd call that a large difference, but in the fish world, maybe it is. But then we see we're about 10 centimeters shorter than what they reported in the 1980s off of Depot Bay. 
Um, that's a pretty big shift. There may be some effects of how the model was fit in there. Um, if anyone here knows how to get access to that old raw data or knows how we could find it, we would love to take a look at this and refit it with some new methods to see what we find. Because um, it may suggest that near shore, the heavier fishing that's been going on persistently may be going on, but we can't really disentangle those two effects. Um, growth rate and T0, I'm not going to dwell on. We basically see there's not a huge big shift of differences between them that I would argue is important. Yeah. So are these values for without uh, is, is sex and these are just females? Thank you for asking. Females. Yeah, I just reported females because now it's going to look at maturity, and if we put males in there, it gets confused. So yeah, no thanks, Mark. This is just for females. So then, if we look at the um, age at 50% maturity and length at 50% maturity. Um, for age, we see most studies were in the mid fours, except for Bob's study in 2015. Only two years before gets about 5.7 years. So almost a year and a half, two years difference from what we see. So it really suggests the importance of these repetitive sampling, just how just your samples of what you get can really drive your fit. Um, and then if we look at length at 50% maturity, our studies and Bob's really line up pretty well with the only difference being that California, they seem to be a little bit shorter when they're hitting the maturity. There's no data reported for the offshore component of this study because we didn't have enough small immature fish to get a good fit. Our error estimates were over a thousand times higher than the um, fit, so it just didn't make sense. Lee, I've got a question about yeah. the little fish and lack of them offshore. Mm -hmm. um, you're fishing in a much bigger water column, and I'm just wondering if that might have been part of the issue, or if you really think that there are fewer of the small fish out there. No, I think it's uh, it's definitely, I think, effort-driven. Um, we see a ton of little fish that we think are deacons on our cameras when we're out there. Um, when we fish offshore, we could get our 50 fish much faster than near shore. It was, we struggled, we had to throw back a lot of fish, but they also get horrific barotrauma. We, every fish we were sending back out there probably wasn't surviving. So, you know, they just, your hooks would be down and we'd have six fish on almost every drift so and every hook. Yeah, small, yeah, okay. they fed really hard out there, um, especially in 2017. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about condition. Terry? Where did you break the near shore and the offshore? Uh, we had Seal Rock and Silette's Reef where our near shore and stone wall was our offshore. Rocks. Depth-wise, we just fished throughout that reef because they were continuous. So basically, it's offshore of that kind of depth contour, but we did, were fishing on the top of Stonewall, so it's there are shallow fish out there, but they're out deep. So yeah, we did find fish. We actually um, expanded the depth range. We found some fish out at the nail, um, so that was actually an increase in the depth range for these guys. So could I ask a second question? Yeah. Why, if you're so effective? Why did the actual marine fishery service net show survey show virtually no fish? So that's a really interesting thing. Um, so for deacons and blue rockfish, I looked into this quite a bit. They talk about in midwater fisheries, they just really struggle to catch these fish. Um, and so my guess is that blues and deacons are really good at net avoidance. Um, if you look at the eye morphology of a blue and deacon rockfish, they're kind of tilted up. And uh, some studies that we've been partnering a little bit on with the pigmentation and how they feed seems to be pretty different. And so we think that they're probably just avoiding predators. They're very skittish when you see them on cameras, so they can move quicker than a lot of these other fish. So I think that's what's going on. And I think the eye morphology, I'll go into this, is really their heavy focus on a zooplankton diet. I think that's what's driving a lot. That's basically going to be the take home of this whole talk, so we can all go home. <laughs> um, so. All right, so yeah, questions are great. I really appreciate it. Um, so here's the fish condition. So left side is the near shore, the right side is the offshore. Dark bars are females, light bars are males. And then we have two kind of blocks of columns in each of those near shore, offshore. The left side is February through August. The right side is October through December. And that's based on the maturity months. Uh, the October, December is when the females are just getting ready to release their larvae, their ovaries are growing, and the others are kind of when they're in their resting state. And so again, this is that fish condition, those residuals extracted from that uh, model fit to look at the differences. 
the three-way ANOVA is significant, suggesting we have all those differences in there. So I'll kind of walk you through this. Um, so let's look at the near shore. In general, the near shore's fish condition, they're a little happier, they're a little healthier, and fatter fish, um, just kind of across the board. In the winter time, that uh, right uh, dark block, you see that the females are in better condition. That's not really surprising. Their ovaries are growing. You would expect that they're going to have a little bit more weight in there. Kind of tracks with what you'd expect. If we go to the offshore, we see that in general fish conditions kind of low. They're kind of wimpy. They're skinnier, a little scrawny. Um, they're bigger fish, but they're a little bit under what you would expect. And then, except for in the wintertime, you see that kind of bump in the females, again, probably related to those gonads, but a strong drop in the males. Um, I'll explain what my hypothesis is for why that is in a few slides from here. Um, so looking at stock structure, so this is work that was done by Felix, one of Kathleen's postdocs in uh, concert with us. So like I said, I'll talk a little bit about it, but a lot of the genetic stuff is really kind of above my skill set. So uh, the left graph, the um, more histogram shaped graph, is looking at the otolith shape. So it's seeing if we can use just the shape of an otolith to identify the different stocks. The light blue is the fish from the near shore, the dark blue is from the offshore. And so the means of those two histograms are slightly different from each other. And in a statistical sense, I can tell you they are very different from each other. There's no way I think that those, I could argue those were separate stocks based on this. And if I, I look at them, I don't see anything. But in a statistical sense, they are. Um, an interesting kind of anecdote. When we started this, what triggered this is we had a small sample size. We just were like, hey, let's take some pictures of Otolith while we're doing this. Why not create more work for ourselves? Um, so we started taking the pictures, and those uh, distributions were really shifted. And then as we started adding more and more samples, we started getting closer and closer. And so as we started going through Otolith morphology studies, we found that there was pretty much this big split in the literature that a lot of people would have either in the 50s of samples or in the high hundreds. There's not really this middle ground and this sampling effect has immense effects on how things play out. So it's kind of an interesting thing to consider going forward. So on the right side, we have uh, the genetics looking at to see if there's any evidence of stock structure, the dark dots being the offshore, the uh, light blue being the nearshore. And you see as you have really strong overlap between the two. But what you also do see is that there are those kind of two different bimodal areas, the left and the right. And so Felix did some great searching and looking and figured out that these were um, sex-based differentiation, that we were actually seeing the females and the males separating out like this. Um, the hypothesis being differential selection. And like I said, I am not a geneticist, so at this point I'm going to pass off. If you have questions, you can find Kathleen or Michael or someone who knows way more about these things than me, and uh, hopefully they can answer. Um, so that's kind of most of what we came out of with, from study one. A few kind of interesting anecdotes before we move on. So that middle picture, the fish we were catching, especially in the offshore, were chock full of pyrosomes. So they were hitting the deck. They were just regurgitating pyrosomes everywhere. Um, I, as I've been going through this talk, thinking about it, I have started to wonder if the fish condition, that poor condition we're getting, is just from basically moving to a pure pyrosome diet. If they were actually getting this low nutrition food, and that may be what's going on relative to their more normal kind of jellyfish or salt diet. I don't know. It's a hypothesis, not proven or tested or anything, just a guess. Um, the other thing is in the near shore, uh, we looked at gut contents just for fun. And we found that if they didn't have pyrosomes, they were full of pinotherid zoea, so pea crab zoea, and just them, which is pretty wild to think about. These are really small zoea. They're mixed in the water column with a number of other species. That means they're going around picking out individual zoea as they're feeding. So, their eyes seem to be really good at finding little things in what they're doing. So there's some pretty interesting uh, trophic work to be done with these guys. And then I mentioned this, but this is some of the young of the year. I mean, we did catch age zero fish that were just settled offshore. So I would suggest this. This means they're settling out there. We see the big swarms on the video. It could mean that they're settling in the near shore and then instantly moving offshore. Um, but I, my guess is that they are settling out there. So if we go to the stock assessments, um, we did all this actually while the stock assessments were running. And a lot of these data were used. And what you see is that we end up with Oregon in a much healthier population. We don't end up with restrictions. These are good things for us. So in the management sense, these kind of basic data have um, good implications for us. So moving towards our second study. Um, so in the, we talked to fishermen. A lot of people talk about how, oh, the Deacon rockfish leave the near shore. They migrate away. 
And this is catch per unit effort on the y-axis and month on the x. What you see is these really low numbers in catch per unit effort. Um, we go out and do video work, and I see giant schools of Deacon all summer long. Um, they're always there. So we decided we would try and do some tagging to understand the behavior of these fish and kind of look and see what they were doing out there. Um, so we installed uh, a bunch of acoustic listening receivers. So the left uh, plot is what we did during the summer, and the right is what we did during the winter. And so we have an outer fence during the summer to look if they're moving offshore, and then we have an inner really high resolution grid um, in the middle portion, and that triangle that you can barely see is a CTD that was deployed all summer long. And then on the right, because of winter storms, we have acoustic noise, we had to go to a bigger grid array, so we just went to this smaller uh, uh, nine grid um, system. Uh, we tagged 11 female fish. We only did females because we needed large fish, and with deacons, that sexual dimorphism forced us towards females. We only did 11 because of that high-resolution grid. Uh, any more than that, we had tags stepping on each other, and we would have had bad data. Um, fish were caught and then barrelized so that we could, if you bring them up the next day or next day after they've been in a barrel, they don't have barotrauma. Makes them easier to tag, more likely they're going to survive, we can test them. Um, and then we uh, tagged them and measured acceleration and depth. Uh, so first thing we did is just looked at general home range and uh, core range sizes. So home range is where they spend 95% of their time, a core range is 50% of their time using the GME tool and GIS. And this is one, if you have questions, I can defer you to other people. Um, we did habitat classification using benthic terrain modeler to try and understand where in this uh, rugose reef these fish were actually spending these time. What the, were they on the rocky areas, the soft water areas, kind of things like that, and compared those. And then we looked at uh, deal and seasonal behaviors using generalized additive models to try and understand just how they were moving and what they were doing. So this first plot is looking at home ranges and core areas. So I just haphazardly chose two tags. If I tried to show you all of them, we'd spend a lot of time here. And surprisingly for this species, the results are extremely similar. So uh, these maps, the gray area and the kind of relief, that's a multi-beam high resolution map of the bottom. The red is that home range area for that tag, the left one being tag three. Um, and so that's where it spent 95% of its time. Embedded within that, you'll see the little kind of yellow areas. That's where it spent 50% of its time during daytime. And then the little insets in the bottom left are where they spent 50% of their time during the nighttime. That is exactly the same size. The nighttime is always underneath the daytime. So that's why I'm having to show you as an inset. And the green dots where the receivers are. Um, and if you look at the scale bar on the bottom right, that's 200 meters. These are really small areas. These rockfish are not moving much. Rockfish are known for that. But these are semi-pelagic, which a lot of times people think of are more movable, or moving more. Um, their home range is about 5,000 square meters. Daytime core ranges in 550, and their nighttime about 140 square meters. Um, so that means at nighttime they're staying in pretty darn small areas. Um, and we've gone out and done some video work at night, and we're finding deacons just hard on the bottom, laying on the bottom in these kind of clusters and just always in the same areas. Um, we're trying to do acoustics work. That tells us that probably working at night is not going to be a great time for us to go. Um, so then if we take those core areas during the day and night and we try and understand what the bottom was like. So our x-axis is VRM, which is vector ruggedness metric. And so it tells us how rough the bottom is. Bigger numbers, rougher bottom, smaller numbers, less rough bottom. And the yellow areas that you see are the daytime and the dark areas are the nighttime. And so the daytime, what you see is that they're using a wider range of areas. They're not all the way at the roughest of the areas, but you know, a broader spread. If you look at nighttime, they're in very low relief areas, and it's very restricted to that specific area. So then uh, we started looking at their uh, seasonal behavior. So uh, y-axis is acceleration. If I showed you this with uh, depth, it would be exactly the same thing. And I'll show you some other plots with depth, but it's, for this, it's just less graphs to show you. So y-axis is acceleration, x-axis is hour of day. I had to cut two plots to get off, so that's why there's no numbers. But the gray boxes are nighttime, and the white box in the middle is daytime. So the ends of each of those x-axes are midnight. And so what you see is in January and February and March, you see kind of these flat lines. They're just kind of moving around, no major trends or anything like that. Uh, let's ignore April. Our tags are starting to die there, so there's not a ton of data points. 
But as we start coming, well, we, this is May actually is when we started, but as we start coming to May, we start to see this deal effect. These rises or increase in activity with the um, sunrise and decrease with sunset. An increase in that with June. We move on to July. We see that strengthening. August, it gets very strong. We see this really strong deal effect. Same with September. October, our fall transition starts to happen. We start to go to this more static, just kind of level acceleration. And so very strong models here. This is all the tags rolled together. I could show you every tag individually, and you'd find exactly the same thing. These guys are surprisingly very coherent in what they're doing. With Unlike a lot of rock push, we say, oh, this half did this, this quarter did this, this quarter we're not sure. It was uh, pretty outstanding what we were finding. Um, and so I mentioned we had a CTD deployed. So our x-axis is the date, our y-axis, um, the blue line is the temperature, and the green line is the oxygen. And we chose three different periods, uh, a hypoxic event, a normoxic event, and uh, what we call the high normoxia um, event. Um, the temperature during the high normoxia is obviously higher than that of the normoxia and hypoxia, but the temperature during hypoxia and normoxia were statistically different at a hundredth of a degree C. So I would argue in an ecological sense, they're probably about the same. So that's really good for us because oxygen temperature co-vary. So that means that if we see any behavioral differences, it's likely actually oxygen rather than a temperature. So those same kind of models, our left column is that high normoxia, the middle is the normoxia, and the right is the hypoxia. Top row is acceleration, but now on the bottom I put in depth. Values closer to the bottom or deeper in the water column and higher up or shallower in the water column. So what you see is with high normoxia and normoxia, those strong deal effects. They're coming up into the water column during the day, they're moving around more, and then at night they drop down and they stop moving as much. Hypoxia, kind of static. They're just moving around, they're higher in the water column, not these big deal effects, some effect, um, but you see this really strong change in what they're doing. Um, so then if we look at those three time periods, so each of these, these are actually a bunch of black dots overlaid on each other. Those black dots are where a receiver was um, pinged inside of this array. And so the left is a high normoxia, the middle is normoxia, they're kind of hanging out in their clusters. There were three kind of schools we probably were sampling. But then we go into hypoxia and we have these forays, these movements. They're milling around, they're looking, they're trying to figure out something. If it's needing oxygen or different things, I can come up with a lot of hypotheses, but we couldn't necessarily get at those physiological responses. But we do see this pretty interesting response to hypoxia. Um, so that's the end of study two. There probably more we could do with it, but that's where we ended up with it. Um, so just the quick conclusions. Um, from the age and growth work, we found larger older fish offshore. Not necessarily surprising, but some good um, evidence and things to have. There is statistical evidence of a stock, uh, questionable on the ecological or management side, I would suggest. Um, we do find variations in growth parameters and the, do find some effects in the population dynamics models. So really, as we do sampling, we do need to sample those offshore populations, even if we aren't necessarily fishing them because they probably have important implications. And uh, overall, I'd suggest there is the potential for an importance of those offshore stocks. With movement, they have very small core areas with extremely strong uh, deal effects and hypoxia-induced movement. Um, and they seem to really like that low relief habitat during the night, which is pretty interesting. Um, for our work, I mean, I've mentioned most of these. We want to continue to look at that offshore age structure as time these fisheries start to progress, see what we see. Um, we'd like to look for more of the young of the year, kind of try and see if we can get more information out of them. It's kind of a general background project we always have, searching for young of the year. Um, so we have a standing permit to kind of look for them. And then apply those stock methods elsewhere. It's a real open question in a lot of these uh, nearshore species of do we have different stocks. And then with movement, we'd love to tag those offshore fish, see how they're moving around if we see similar trends. That bear trauma makes it really, really hard. Um, when we get them up to the top, they're so beat up that I'm not sure the tags would survive. We talked about cutting fishing lines and just only sampling the very top and trying to work that way, but I don't know. It's a hard area to work out there. Um, and just a side project for telemetry is uh, yellow eye rockfish in our telemetry work. Some leave really long distance, some stay close. So we've been uh, leaning towards doing some satellite tagging. So hopefully in the future we'll hear about satellite tagging of rockfish.
And with that, I can take any questions. I'm looking at my team. We did. I'm trying to remember. Did we get Blues offshore? I don't think we did. I don't think we did. Yeah, Terry. So the outside range for this species was told to me by a guy at Fort Bragg fish on Tom Sino. And he said they caught quite a few in midwater trawl on Tom Sino. Do you have any data to show like that? So this was before it was blue and deacon, so I do have um, I have actually age structures. I have a I have a bag of um, thin sectioned olus taken at Cobb Seamount, so I do have them. When we look at them, I can look at other species of otoliths, and I do have some whole ones, and they do seem to be within the blue deacon world. Um, but which one they are, I don't know. I Probably my next uh, Oceanus grant will be to ask to go out to Cobb Seamount and see what's out there with them. That's definitely something we've talked about, because I'd be really curious to do that and try and do some population genetics, see where they're coming from and things like that. You know, on the acoustic study, did you detect anything on the fence that would have been we had two that went to the fence right away, and then that was it. Yeah, nothing really strong. So, uh, if I'm getting this right, the, in the winter time, there's a thought that they might be moving offshore, but your movement summertime moving offshore. Summertime, so but your movement suggests that they're they're just not as accessible to the fishermen. Is there like a uh, Behavioral difference, and they're just hanging down. Um, is that like a hibernation almost? Or I don't think it's a hibernation. I think feeding? I think it's a feeding thing. So, like I said, they're really into gelatinous zooplankton, and we have the blooms of gelatinous creatures more during the summer. So, I think the fleet doesn't capture them as much during the summer because their preferred food source comes available. They can basically satiate themselves on that diet, and then in wintertime, they're still there, but not to the extent. They're declining. They're having to eat more forage fish, other things. So they're not going to starve themselves to death. So they're going to eat. But when their preferred food source is there, they're going to eat that. And so that's why we were able to sample them year round with hook and line. Those herring jigs, um, there we've talked to them. Some people think they mimic a siphonophore. And so we think that might be why that they're able to feed on them a little better is that they, they work and look a little more like jelly. Um, Somebody who used to work for me used to make fake jelly to feed to um, prow fish because they like jelly. So we've talked about trying to make gelatinous bait and just see what would happen. I don't know. It would be a fun thing to do, but hard to justify going out fishing just to play with bait. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One last question about National Marine Fisheries Net Survey. If you show this species as a catchability, if they miss this species, shouldn't we go through and look at our stock assessment and see if there's other species that have a catchability? Because I know salmon is hard to catch in, in the nets, and now deacons, but they're obviously there and they're not catching them. I mean, I catchability is a huge component of every survey and stock assessment. I think it's, you know, as we're moving towards designing these acoustic surveys for these species, and deacons are one that we're, we are designing a survey for, you know, catchability is, I guarantee, going to be the, one of the biggest things I'm going to get hit with. Um, it's a really hard parameter to get at. I mean, it's... Well, up to this point, it's been assumed they catch everything that's there. Yeah. And now what you're done is identified species there they couldn't. I think it behooves you to push National Marine Fisheries Service to do a catchability work on their nets. Yeah, that does make sense. You yes, sir. Genetically ambiguous individuals. Yeah. Like what proportion were you seeing and how is that looked like? A small proportion, I'd say, in the half percentage of what we were seeing across. So. But I mean, in 900 individuals, I mean, it's you know five or six individuals, but higher than I kind of would have expected from my own. Yeah, someone trying to launch fish. Well, we were just in Seal Rock, Solettes, and. So there's no other work like that. You mentioned California. But... No, that in their work we didn't see anything. Um, but it was my age reader who since left was an author on that paper. I wasn't on it, so I've just seen that side of it. So. Tom. When when in the hypoxic time. When the 
you know how deep the hypoxic layer was, or were they staying above, or like how it's just, it just like bottom stuff? We just had the bottom CTD. We didn't have a full profiler. So we just had it hard to the bottom, so we know it's epoxic on the bottom. As for the water column, I pulled the near shore hydrodynamic model and looked at the layers, and it suggested it was full water column, which I didn't really agree with. So it's a hard area to model. So unfortunately, no, we don't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.